people like you are a part of this tantra reawakening movement let's talk about the positive aspects of wearing a genuine rudraksha devi purana what is mentioned is if shakti rudraksha is worn 21 generations receive enlightenment so 11 generation forward 11 generation backward what's it like growing up in nepal growing up in nepal is a blessing because nepal is a dev bhumi bhumi of where shiva is bhumi where pashupatinath is does nepal have a lot of presence of bhairav Yes. The upasana of Bhairav in Nepal is done to counter the effects of Shani. Bhairav is also a deity that you will be drawn into if you are affected a lot by evil eye. Love as a human need is actually not romantic but it's spiritual. You have the capacity to love, you think you want a girlfriend or a boyfriend, but that love exists within you to give to God. Shiva is everywhere. Every single step you take towards spirituality, whether it just be Om Namah Shivaya, it's all adding up you and i will start crying if we go deeper into shiva his aghor tapasya for the aghor weapon is what created rudraksha for us who live in the material it is very difficult for us to imagine that a seed which is available today right next door can change one's life it's been 5 years of podcasting and rarely have i come across a guest who's younger than me but still speaks in depth about multiple spiritual subjects sukritya is based out of nepal his family his grandfather was a pandit at the pashupatinath temple and he spent his entire life growing up right in front of the temple today's episode is centered around two themes the first theme being shiva a subject that can be explored infinitely and explored it will be in depth in this episode and the second subject being something very close to my heart because i've begun my own journey with deeper forms of upasana i've begun my journey with tantra that's led me to learning about what a rudraksh what a mala really is they say tantra is a combination of mantras as well as yantras and when we're speaking about yantras or tools one of the most powerful tools in all of sanatan dharma is the mala is the rudraksh this episode is a one one on the rudraksh as well as a deep dive into the subject of shaivism sit back relax and enjoy this gen z spiritual coach his name is sukritya kathiawada i was absolutely blown away by his knowledge as well as his conviction when it comes to his subject I'm sure you'll feel the same at the end of the episode. It's one of those therapeutic, deeply ethereal Shiva specials of T R S. Sukriti abhai how are you i'm doing good how are you i'm good man young spiritual entrepreneur doing very very cool things uh i want to honestly tell you why you're on the show yeah uh i began something called a bhairav upasana mm-hmm. fairly recently mm-hmm. where uh, i needed a rudraksh to practice the bhairav upasana because i'm starting to understand that what we refer to as sanatan dharma mm. or hinduism mm. uh in certain verticals requires yantras mm. yantras are devices that further your practice yeah. but the issue is that there's a lot of false yantras out there mm-hmm. there's a lot of people who don't know how to use the yantras correctly correct uh and then you need to understand the truth about genuine powerful yantras that led me to finding nepa rudraksh and then i kind of started doing my research i tried understanding who is in charge of this and i was shocked to know you are 24 so how has this happened um is it an outcome of shiv ji at play <laughs> yeah what's happening i think you know first and foremost thank you for having me um i really believe that you know everything is destined and my story Uh, yes i'm 24 but it transcends my age and it uh, goes be you know go, starts at 
around 1960s when uh, late uh, Srimati Lakshmi, my grandmother, started Nepa Rudraksha as a brand. Um, and my uh, grandfather Balram Khatiyoda was also you know, involved in it. And then uh, throughout generations, my father, my grandfather, every one of us has been committed to providing Rudraksha to the world. So as you rightly pointed, you know, um, Rudraksha is a sadhan for sadhana. So you're doing upasana of Bhairavji. So you need a tool to complete that sadhana, you know, sadhana that you're doing. And Rudraksha is definitely that. And so, there's too many fakes out there. There is a lot of, uh, you know, fake Rudraksha. Unfortunately, in today's day, Rudraksha, whenever we talk about Rudraksha, the first question you, you'll get asked is, is it a real Rudraksha? It's not like that for banana. If you, if I give you a banana, you're not going to ask me, is it a poisoned banana? You know, it's, but in Rudraksha, uh, what has happened is the second, almost the synonym of Rudraksha has gone into, you know, question about authenticity, which is very sad. Uh, it, it does show that we're, you know, in the verge of Kali Yuga, where, you know, even on things like Rudraksha, which is the most auspicious tool out there for humans, uh, the fakes are there. So yeah, you're right. There are there are a lot of counterfeit Rudrakshas in the market. Uh, and uh, that that's the unfortunate truth of today. The world is waking up to Tantra again. That's my reading. Mm -hmm. uh, tantra loosely translates to technique. Mm -hmm. This is something I picked up from Rajarji Nandi on the show. So many of the audience members, even watching this podcast, mm -hmm. have consumed all the Rajarji Nandi episodes. Yeah. Uh, it makes me think that people like you are a part of this Tantra reawakening movement. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to kind of ask you a little bit more about the purpose of a Rudraksh mm -hmm. uh, in order to understand how to further one spiritual practice more. I know aspects of it, mm -hmm. uh, but I struggled to find the right Rudraksh, yeah. uh, which made me kind of research into this sub subject of Sanatana. Mm -hmm. So I actually want you to explain what a Rudraksh is from a very, very basic perspective and why it's important, uh, you know, right from the Rudraksh tree, like yeah. what is a Rudraksh tree? Yeah. Uh, why is this such a valued device in Sanatan Dharma? And uh, why is there even room for fakes? Yeah, so that's a that's a very heavy question. Let me break it down. Okay, so Rudraksha in it, uh, when, when we talk about the word Rudra Aksha, Rudra means Shiva. Aksha is the uh, tear drops. So Rudraksha in basic, very simple terms is tear drops of Shiva. So how do we see the origins of Rudraksha? We can we can refer to a lot of ancient texts. Let's let's go back into Shiva Purana. Uh, from the first Samhita, the Videshwar Samhita of Shiva Purana, chapter 23, we'll start seeing the mentions of Rudraksha being there. Okay. The origin of Rudraksha is said in the Shiva Purana that Shiva went into great tapas for thousands of years. Okay. And when he opened his eyes, the tear of joy fell into the world and out of which the first, you know, the, the tree that grew was the tree of Rudraksha. And this is the only tool where Shiva specifically manifested the tree to, for the good of the mankind. So this is meant for the betterment of the mankind. Okay. If we go for Devi Bhagavat Purana, which is also intensively focused on Shiva Purana, Devi Bhagavat has about 12 chapters in it. Uh, the chapter, tw uh, not 12 chapters, sorry, 12 sections in it. The 12 11th section uh, from chapter 3 onwards to chapter 5 is solely again dedicated on Rudraksha. So here you tend to see like a, uh, like a pattern that, you know, these Puranas, we have 18 of them in uh, Hinduism, right? In Sanatana Dharma, we have 18 uh, Puranas. Two of them are specifically focusing on a tool, which is Rudraksha. So there must be a reason for it is what you'll, you'll start to notice if you're a beginner to that, right? So if we go deeper, Rudraksha is, like I said, a, sad, a, a, a tool or a sadhan to further your sadhana. There is three ways. You talked about Tantra. So Tantra, the mention of Tantra comes again in Shiva Purana. The first Samhita of Shiva Purana talks about the three ways a person can transform their lives, right? It's transformative. That is Mantra, Tantra, Yantra. Rudraksha encapsulates all three. Because mantra sadhana is based on Rudraksha as well. You do the japas, right? The fingers, everything you already know about. Then comes the tantra. Tantra, like you mentioned, is a process, but it's also a system through which transformation happens. Tan, if we just look at the word tan, 
then it's all about body. So the meditation that you do, the chakra sadhana, the chakra healings that you do is also a tantra. You need a certain spiritual tool to be able to understand and make sense of the energies that you're getting out of these sadhanas, mm. right? And Rudraksha is again useful in that. You, you start to make sense of the energies that are coming to you. If without Rudraksha or without a tool or a sadhan, you are unable to, you know, adjust to the energies that are coming to you through these tantra sadhanas that you perform. So I talked about mantra tantra. Lastly, the yantra aspect. Yes, Rudraksha is also worn as an individual bead for protection. Again, protection and manifestation. According to the Srimad Bhagavat uh, uh, Devi Purana, what we see there is Rudraksha has two energies. One is of bhog, second of mukti. So bhukti and mukti both are provided by Rudraksha. The bhog aspect is all about, you know, being able to manifest things and being able to get material fulfillment mm. because we are made out of physical and energy. And the energy aspect is all about mukti. So Rudraksha is also your gateway or a tool, sadhan again, towards mukti. So both of them are there in Rudraksha. That's why you, you'll see that, you know, I wouldn't say it's getting famous or getting, you know, uh, getting out there now. It's always been in news. You know, it's it's the oldest tool. You If you look at any Jyotirlingas, for example, the 12 Jyotirlingas, one thing you'll find in common, even the mantras will be different because they're of different dialects. One thing you'll find common is the main priest that is touching the Shivling will always be wearing the Rudraksha. Because the understanding has been there through generations and ancient times that in order for you to be able to do any kind of Vedic rituals, you need to attend Rudraksha. So what I think is happening is people are again turning back into being able to, you know, do sadhanas and uh, getting back into spiritual practices. And Rudraksha is a byproduct. It's eventually you will end up using it and leading to it. Uh -huh. So it's, it's on the way. It's as if you're going from point A to point B. The, the middle section is 100% going to have Rudraksha anyways. Mm. Now I'll also cover why fake Rudraksha is there, right? So what's happened is Rudraksha is made out of Mukhi. You know, the faces of Rudraksha is known as Mukhi. What we can see and the nature of Rudraksha is such that you can actually, if people can actually carve Mukhis themselves. So to make fake ones is easy. Secondly, not a lot of people know Rudraksha is extremely rare. Nepali Rudraksha, extraordinarily rare. Okay, We claim ourselves as being the world's largest collection. You would think I have a lot of Rudraksha sitting there, right? I literally have a really, really less amount of inventory of Rudrakshas because Nepali Rudraksha, if authentic, is going to be extremely rare. So how do we meet the exceeding demand is... Some of the vendors, some of the people are taking shortcuts into, you know, making fakes. So that's that's the unfortunate truth about Rudraksha. That's the reason, you know, the rarity of the Rudraksha is what causes fake Rudrakshas to emerge in the market. Okay. Um, how do you even create a fake Rudraksha? And I, I would actually go as far as saying, let's get into botany a little bit. Yeah. What is a Rudraksha? Like, is it a seed of a tree? Is it a fruit? What is happening in terms of nature. So Rudraksha is a fruit of a tree. The seed within the fruit is what Rudraksha is. Okay, Rudraksha grows in Nepal and primarily in Nepal's uh, Arun Valley, which is the deep and, deepest point in the world, right? There is where Rudraksha grows. Now, Rudraksha, like, looking like Rudraksha substances grow in Indonesia as well. But our focus, if you are going into the spiritual route, on not the jewelry side is going to be on the Nepali Rudraksha. That is where in, in the Arun Valley region is there is a small, you know, Nepal itself is a small country out of which there is only one valley where Rudraksha grows. Okay. And if you talk about how do you create fakes and how fakes are coming in, first you need to understand that Rudraksha, it ranges in Mukhis. And as Mukhis grow up, the rarity increases. Mukhi is the face of a Rudraksha. So a basic structure of Rudraksha is, it is a seed, uh, similar to what I'm wearing here. And it has different faces in it, okay? And each face represents a deity. The most common face that if a person is wearing Rudraksha, they don't have any idea of what they're wearing, they're 100%, 99% wearing a five Mukhi Rudraksha. That is most produced. But as you step up in your sadhana, as you progress in your sadhana, you encounter Mukhis like, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 21 Mukhi Rudrakshas, which in a given year, 
two or three exists. Damn. So that is going to be extraordinarily rare. Okay. And powerful. And the power, you know, I'm just a human to describe the power of the Rudraksha. So it is immensely powerful, immensely powerful. Okay. And you have to be destined to get it because one, it is rare. Second, you need to be able to handle the energy, right? According to the Puranas, what is mentioned is not a lot of people have interest in getting Rudraksha and that is written. Okay. You have to be destined and chosen in order for you to even think about Rudraksha. And People who I have co- talked with, you know, by the grace of God, we have been doing this through three generations, right? Um, the people that I talk with, they have visions and dreams of Rudraksha before they come into buying Rudraksha or getting Rudrakshas from themselves. So I don't believe you buy Rudraksha. I think it comes into your life and it manifests. Uh, how big is a 21 Mukhi Rudraksha? So 21 Mukhi Rudraksha is around 21 to 32, 34, 35 mm, right? So this one, the one that was found in Nepal in 2023, which was the largest 21 Mukhi, uh, eventually, you know, procured by Nepal Rudraksha, which is already gone. It's not no longer available. It was 39 mm bead compared to the size of the ones you're wearing so i'm wearing a 25 mm bead so these are and and rudraksha is either round or flat the flatter is the higher mukhi rudrakshas so as rudraksha grows from 11 mukhis and up they start to get it flatter okay um i can show you images of the of the rudraksha bead just for comparison sake uh, and your you know audiences as well as you can see what i'm talking about but 21 mukhi is going to be flatter and a longer bead so and and extremely rare like i said okay well answered <laughs> yeah. uh tell me one thing like about this authenticity versus fake rudraksh you said that it's seeds of a tree mm-hmm. right uh, how do you know that, okay, this one is authentic because there'll be many seeds, only some of them qualify as a Panch Mukhi, that's what I'm assuming, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the rest don't. Yeah. So the people who make fake Rudrakshas, they go pick up the fake ones and then kind of carve a face on it. That's how it's a fake. I'm, so that's what I'm assuming. Yeah. So the Rudraksha, the practice of Rudraksha has, you know, it it begins from the time, beginning of time, right? So there's a lot of people who are aware about the knowledge of Rudraksha have a lot of history on this. So it's not as simple as carving a face on it, right? So a authentic Rudraksha needs to be x-rayed, okay? So for example, if you get Rudraksha through Nepa Rudraksha, okay, and many of the reputable vendors, what you will find with the Rudraksha is an x-ray report of the Rudraksha because the X-ray, we can see the number of compartments is equivalent to the number of Mukhis. Okay. On the fake ones, if X-ray is performed, you will be able to tell instantly that's a fake Rudraksha. So certification is there. There's a lot of ways one can protect themselves from fake Rudrakshas and manipulated ones. Okay. But manipulation happens when, you know, uh, and and these happens in the secondary market. If you're going through a reputable source, you'll no, not encounter any manipulated products. But in the secondary market, for example, on the shops near the temples, you know, unfortunately, that is, unfortunately, on, you know, these kind of vendors, what you will see is fake Rudrakshas are in abundance. And another thing is people are unaware about the origin of Rudraksha. So you're doing a Upasana. You're more likely wearing, you know, using a small mala. The mala comes from Indonesia. That is not a Nepali Rudraksha, right? So a Nepali Rudraksha can never be that small. A smallest Nepali Rudraksha is going to be this big. Mm. Okay. So, and what is done is, you know, and that Rudraksha is not a bad Rudraksha per se. For Japa, that is used. But for wearing, you wear a Nepali Rudraksha, according to the Shiva Purana. And a Nepali Rudraksha is literally only found in that one valley in Nepal. Correct. If Even if I grow a tree in Kathmandu, for example, the city that I'm from, the capital of Nepal, you'll not be able to find Rudraksha there. Like it won't uh, even grow on that tree? It will grow. It will only grow five Mukhi Rudrakshas. It will not grow the higher Mukhi Rudrakshas or the more powerful Rudrakshas. And the quality will be extremely bad. When I say talk about quality, the weight of the bead will be not good. The shape will be, you know, uh, it, it, it won't be symmetrical. So only certain temperatures, certain soils, and I truly believe certain energies need to be there in that, you know, Pavan Bhumi for it to be able to grow Rudrakshas. People have tried, you know, because of the value that they see in Rudraksha, they have tried growing it in all over the places, right? But 
not successfully it only grows in the arun valley in nepal podcasting question what's the price of one so the price of rudraksha ranges from you know merely 5 dollars all the way to more than 50000 dollars for a single bead that's okay. how much in indian rupees in indian rupees that's going to be around 40 to 45 lakhs for wow. a single seed you can that's a very common price to have okay so it can range above that as well there has been cases where rudrakshas are sold for almost 65 to 70 lakhs for a single bead sourced from arun valley sourced from arun valley exclusively indonesian rudrakshas or rudraksha source elsewhere is never going to be as expensive those are going to be around your you know hardly 5000 to uh 10000 rupees indian currency that's very expensive for those but if you're getting authentic nepali rudraksha of a higher mukhi you will be paying up to 60 lakhs almost let's talk about the positive aspects of wearing a genuine rudraksha yeah what are the positive aspects like how does it actually change i know we can't get into the details of uh upasana here you know? mm-hmm. but just on a surface level how do you explain how a rudraksha changes one's life so you know we've been dealing with rudraksha since this you know since more than three generations and the only thing that we do as a family is rudraksha and transformation with rudraksha right and the transformation that i have seen we cannot be this it cannot be described with words that's how powerful a rudraksha is how it works is rudraksha is like i said a bead manifested by shiva for the healing of mankind each of the faces of the rudraksha will carry a certain energy for example a 14 mukhi rudraksha will be of shani mahashan rudraksha it's known as saturn right so if a person saturn is weak and they wear the 14 mukhi rudraksha the debilitation can change into an exaltation it will increase the power of the planet and hence show positive impact to the person as well secondly the rudraksha works in fourfold any kind of transformation happens in fourfold dharma artha kama moksha you go through this cycle right so the first impact that a rudraksha causes is a behavioral impact which is more of dharma the person will be more wary of their actions they will be more you know they will be more in line with their spiritual self and start making decisions that meet the criteria for one to be able to wear rudraksha that's the dharmic aspect second arthik like i said bhukti mukti both are provided by rudraksha so we have seen wearing rudraksha is directly you know impacting the material fulfillment as well and that is also a spiritual side because without material fulfillment there cannot be renunciation and without renunciation you cannot you know achieve the last aspect which is mukti so after the dharmic aspect after the arthik aspect which is the wealth there is kama kama is relaxation enjoyment and the satisfaction of the self after which mukti comes in which is the end of the cycle and a new cycle begins okay so that is how through these four stages which is known as purushartha in sanskrit dharma artha kama moksha artha four purusharthas these this transformation happens along this way on the surface this sounds like a conversation about rudrakshas mm-hmm. but it's actually a conversation about shiva it is it is a conversation about for shiva for those hearing us they'll think it's a conversation about rudrakshas for those listening they know exactly what this conversation is about yes uh i want to ask you about the people who bought that 70 lakh rudraksha who mm-hmm. was it so i cannot discuss no, i, I yeah. mean i don't want the name yeah i'm talking about who the being was so see when we talk about the expensive rudrakshas the reason they're expensive is because the procurement cost of those beads are also high Why? so because there is huge number of competitors that are trying to get the same rudraksha there is a huge number of buyer trying to get the same rudraksha so it's a basic science of economy right if there is more supply and more more supply less demand the price is really less if there is really less supply but high demand the price is high right so people who are blessed and po- people who are able to manifest the rudraksha into their life are going to be you know are are the ones who wear it right so you have to be destined in a way to wear it i have seen people from all walks of life i have seen doctors wear rudraksha these kind of rudrakshas i have seen business tycoons wear these kind of rudrakshas industrialist most of them if you're looking at them in a close way are using the power of rudrakshas right so 
people from all walks of life, you know, actors, podcasters have worn Rudrakshas in the past who are who are really doing well with the with with Rudrakshas and its energy. So, but you need to be able to uh, you know find the right Rudraksha for you. That's very important. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the practice? Sure. Like the only practice that I've done truly with the Rudraksha is Japa. Yeah. And I keep it on me. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the personal perspective is when you actually begin to work with malas and uh, I think I'm hesitating to talk about this because I'm not sure how much I can talk about mm -hmm. what I do. I don't do anything crazy, but I'm just very disciplined about my mala. Uh, I don't let it touch any surface. Mm -hmm. uh, I always keep it on a cloth. I keep it close to me as much as I can. I'm being very open and vulnerable here. Mm -hmm. uh, I travel with it um, because that's my Anushthan I've taken with my deity. I've promised a certain number of malas every mm -hmm. single day. Yeah. Uh, there have been moments in the recent past where maybe I've been anxious about something or I've not been in the best state of mind. And I've meditated while wearing the mala. I don't know how right that is or how wrong that is. I just intuitively felt uh, I needed to do so. And it could totally be placebo for me, but I felt like it gave me a lot of strength. Uh, these things usually are not placebo in my experience. There's some kind of logic behind things that your heart wishes to do. But when it comes to Nepali Rudrakshas, this is much bigger than the ones I have. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you utilize these? Like, what is the kind of sadhana you do with this? The Nepali Rudrakshas are primarily used for wearing. Just okay? wearing. Just wearing and doing meditation as well, like you rightly pointed. If you if if you go to, for example, Pashpatinath, uh, the you know, the Pashpatinath temple in Nepal, what you'll see the Mool Bhattas, those are the few chosen people who are able to touch the Shivalinga, because not everyone is allowed into the Garbhagriya, right? <laughs> are going to be wearing the Rudrakshas before they do the puja. So any kind of Vedic rites, according to Shiva Purana and Devi Bhagavatam and all the, you know, scriptures requires, it's not a choice, it requires you to wear Rudraksha for you to be able to handle the energy. Secondly, for, for any kind of astrological, you know, um, astrological use, strengthening of planet, or taking care of the malefic planet in your birth chart, Rudraksha is used there as well. Thirdly, for meditation, you wear the Rudraksha. You know, I'm a believer that even if placebo effect is, if you know, impacting you and making a positive impact to you, you should be able to repeat that effect mm. more and more and more. If you're able to repeat the effect for the rest of your life, you you did very well. You know? And it's probably not placebo. Then. Yeah, so and, it, and it's probably not placebo then. There are certain things in the world, Ranveer, that you can only experience and not describe. Mm. Rudraksha's impact and Rudraksha's energy is very that. You cannot describe it with words. Words are very insignificant and, you know, incapable of describing the true nature of how one transforms with the use of Rudraksha. Uh, I truly hope in my heart that people are able to understand the depth of the conversation mm -hmm. that's happening right now. And I hope that people are able to read in between the lines of what you and me are speaking yeah. about. Now I'll move forward in this. How has it changed your life? My journey of life began with wearing Rudraksha. So I don't have, I have very vague memory of my being without a Rudraksha. But I truly believe that what I have been able to achieve you know, maybe less, maybe more, is because of the powers that I have seen with Rudraksha in all aspects of life, not not material. I'm not talking about material. That's the most insignificant. The spiritual aspect of life, you know, I'm 24 years old, like you pointed. The spiritual... Your, your body is 24 years old. My body is 24 years old, like you pointed. You know, my soul is eternal. It's never... I don't know the time it was born because it cannot be told, right? And the spiritual awakening that I've met, you know, that I've felt with wearing the Rudraksha is, you know, beyond words. You know, you're literally the blessing that you get through the Rudraksha is, you know, I'm, I'm unable to describe it with words, like I said. Secondly, it's brought me closer to Shiva. I think about Shiva every single day because I'm wearing the Rudraksha. You know, through Rudraksha, I get closer to Shiva, which is the biggest gain for me that has happened in my life. I've never been, you know, awake and not be thinking about Shiva because I'm wearing the Rudraksha. So it's brought me close to Shiva. And I think that's the single most important transformation that has happened to me. Okay, I want to say certain things that might sound partially egoistic, but I'm truly not coming from an egoistic yeah. place because I believe the work I do 
is simply the work of a medium it's not me asking the questions i've just opened myself up to the questions that are placed in my head mm. okay and the same with opinions especially when i'm in this room mm. so my opinion that i truly feel in my heart right now is that the fact that you're on this podcast considering the fact that you're 24 years old we don't have too many young guests mm. okay that's one aspect of what i want to say second aspect is considering the family you're born into and the fact that they gave you a rudraksh that early in life makes me think about the fact that your soul is different yeah i'm sure you know this and i can feel it while talking to you and i know that the listeners are feeling it through the show also mm. which 24 year old talks like you do yeah I, not a lot not a lot and i i really truly believe believe it's, it's, in it's why i wanted you on the show yeah. like people need to see this yeah so a lot of older people who've been on the show spoken about spirituality etc but this is a case uh which is in motion as i call it mm. in terms of spiritual life is not about giving up on the material mm. it's about moving both those stories forward yeah until you're done with like the material completely yeah but it's important to talk about this phase yeah. as well especially if there's spiritual intention now go on the deity that we worship in uh, you you're absolutely li- right the deity that we worship in kali yuga is rama right ram is the main primary deity that we worship in kali yuga when we look at the life of ram you see that he always fulfilled all his obligations while being a god you can't compare with him but the learning that you get from him is that he was always fulfilling his you know uh, duties and responsibilities as ram and at the same time who was the highest level of spiritual being that a being can attain right so similar to that i truly you know appreciate your point about in today's day you don't need to let go of the material for you to be spiritual that's that's a very uh, narrow minded belief that you know and and i get this all the time people ask me you know that oh i want to wear rudraksha but i don't want to renunciate i don't want to leave my family behind what if my what if i become like a you know like go into sadhana so much that i forget my obligations the first thing is according to shiva in the shiva purana what is mentioned is for you to be able to renunciate you need to have complete fulfillment of desire right so without the complete fulfillment of desire one cannot truly renunciate because there will always be one angle missing so the material fulfillment if you look at it in a deeper perspective is what is leading you to get higher into your spiritual growth so you can take these two things hand in hand you don't have to quit one to begin another and i don't think there is a age for you to be spiritual you know you're born with it i've seen so many people hide the spiritual side of theirs because they think they're not of age right now to be spiritual and sometimes somewhere uh, you know parents also play a role where they try to you know keep the child from not being too spiritual wearing rudrakshas or or doing any kind of sadhanas because they want they're wary they they're protective of the child that you know oh something bad might not happen like they they might reach a energy level which they might not be prepared for but my opinion to that is if they're you know in the way if they're inclined to do so they're the chosen ones not every one of us are and you and i are witness to that yeah what do you think about this um in terms of spirituality choosing you and you not choosing spirituality yeah. i can only talk from a subjective life perspective mm-hmm. which is from age 0 to age 22 um i prayed i was open to god didn't understand it i was not open to meditation i was not open to yoga i was not open to conversations like this that yantras can alter your state of reality and then over the course of running the show i've met so many spiritual people i've met monks sages people who i believe are totally god realized people like yourself who are on their way up uh it's just kind of strengthened that sense of spirituality and i truly believe that it's about the age of the soul and not the age of the body so yeah. what you're saying is completely right and yeah. i would go as far as saying that at least in my observation a lot of the younger generation it's mm-hmm. way more spiritual than even you and me yeah that's that's absolutely correct like there's some wave of spiritual growth happening in the world especially in i want to say india but as india and nepal yeah yeah i i see that all over the world actually and yes you rightly pointed india and nepal were leading the movement but i get you know i get people from even 
the US or international people who are starting to begin and realize that there is something out there and they they want to get into their spiritual you know my mindset their spiritual practice but they're just confused and i believe that lack of information and you you are facilitating a great conversation with people like you know a lot of people that come to your podcast talk about spirituality so thanks to people like yourself and the platform that you have created and many of people like you who have created these platforms conversations like these are being normalized before then you have to be on a temple premises to have these kind of conversations certain people are allowed to have these conversations or certain beings will you know take have these conversations these conversations are not new but the platform that these kind of conversations are getting in this way, this day and age because of people like yourself is new yeah uh, when we have cricketers actors on the show i enjoy it yeah. i enjoy the adulation i enjoy the eyeballs we get but this is the core of what we do yeah so this is the true message mm -hmm. so some of the people who discovered me off of a yuvraj singh podcast should actually come and stay for this because mm -hmm. this is what will actually affect their soul in my eyes yeah um I want to genuinely ask you a lot of stuff about Nepal and yeah. Nepali youth, which in my eyes is possibly a little more spiritually inclined than a lot of the Indian youth that I've met on an average. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in saying that? Like a lot of times when I meet people from Nepal, people your age, people my age, uh, it's just I get the sense of deeper spiritual incline. So there's a couple of questions. What's it like growing up in Nepal? Firstly. it's a very bro question it's out of you know even this shiva conversation we're having and second um about arun valley specifically mm. i want to know about the energy of that place yeah. what is special about the total landmass of your country and then that specific landmass yeah and so, your your life growing up in nepal yeah so that's that's i i think i have mixed answers about that i think i've seen spiritual spiritual being across border, borders and uh, you know in nepal specifically yes the youths of nepal are spiritual and they you know spirituality is not a thing that they do but it's a way of life right so uh, nepal in kathmandu specifically the place where i'm born every 100 meters you will be able to see a temple so on the way to school on the way to on the way to your work you know you will be coming across temples and you know deities all across so you if even if you it's it's as if a tirth yatra between the time you go from destination point a to point b wow. that's how many temples there are you know of different deities so even if a person is just able to chant the mantras of the deities that it he 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 or she passes by during their you know during their commute which is one of the most common thing that people do is going to uplift their spiritual levels right growing up in nepal is a blessing because nepal is a dev bhumi dev bhumi bhumi of where shiva is bhumi where you know pashupati nath is and temples like this you know so similar to india nepal is also a dev bhumi where all the you know this kind of culture not only is but started from sanatana dharma you know all of this started from the mahabharata range of our countries right and i i think that being able to be there experience these temples energies from a really young age is a boon and the blessed soul get to be born in places like india and nepal which are in that spiritual realm and i see people from all over the world pouring in coming here to realize and feel that energy you talked about arun valley how is it so Arun Valley is a very rural area. It's not an area that is that you would think is accessible through a you know through 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 just a ride. It's not a ride to Arun Valley. You have to really be determined to get there. And the energy in Arun Valley is just you can't describe it with words because you are surrounded by these Rudraksha trees. and you are also surrounded by the people who have been doing this and seen transformation of people using rudraksha so the day in life in arun valley revolves around shiva because it revolves around rudraksha ah uh, tell me more why is it difficult to get there so the the altitude the roads so my uh, let me tell you a story about my grandfather okay so the reason nepa rudraksha is nepa rudraksha today is because my grandfather was the first person who was actually able to take rudraksha from arun valley and bring it to kathmandu before then what happened was arun valley was closer to banaras 
So people were actually taking Rudraksha from Arun Valley to Vanaras and from Vanaras they're bringing it to Kathmandu. So the route in itself was so, you know, long. He is the one who went there, made the supply chain, made the infrastructures in order for the Rudrakshas from Arun Valley to be able to come to Kathmandu. So even that happened in the late 1960s. So that's how rural the place is. Even today, the the routes, you have seen the roads of Nepal, it's quite dangerous. So it's, it's I, I would see, I would think that it takes a lot of courage and a lot of determination for one to drive to Arun Valley, which will take them from Kathmandu almost eight, nine hours. And the roads are not in the best of conditions because Nepal, again, country of hills and mountains so it's not easy for you know it's not a flat land where you can you know build roads it's extremely hilly sometimes there's deep steep you know hills and curves and so driving and getting to Arun Valley is very very difficult yeah. in my heart there's two things for me that are waiting in Nepal the first is a future road trip of sorts mm-hmm. I truly want to explore uh-huh your country and I've not been there in my life and it's always been my heart. Sometimes you just know you're going to go to a certain place. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. One detailed, elaborate road trip. The second thing is my future wife. She's in, <laughs> I'm messing yeah. around. It's just the first thing. Yeah. Uh, I have to go to Nepal at some point. You, are, you, ha- you have to and you will be blessed to be in Nepal because yes, the nature, the road trips are there as well as the temples and the spiritual aspect of what you are doing, the upasanas that you are doing, I believe there's a lot of answers hidden in Nepal, so which you'll be told. able to see. So I've been told, um, your family has a deep relationship with the Pashupatina temple. Correct. Let's begin this conversation with a basic 101 about the Pashupatina temple. So Pashupatina temple is known as the head of all Jyotirlingas. It is the only linga, it is the only Shiva linga, which has the head structures of Shiva in the linga itself. Okay. So Shiva, as you know, have five faces, has five faces. The front face is Sadyojad. The left, you have Bamdev. To the right, you have Aghora Rupa. To the behind, you have Tadpurush Rupa. And on the top, which is the Adrishya Rup or the Niraka Rup, is the uh, is the Ishan Rup of the Shiva, right? So in Pashupatinath, it's the only Shiva Linga where you are able to see the four faces. The Adrishya Rup is still you you will not able to see, but the four faces you are able to see. And Pashupatinath and Rudraksha have a lot of relationship because the Bhattas in Pashupatinath again are wearing. Rudraksha while doing the puja. There is an Indra Mala in the vault of Pashupatina temple, which is shown during auspicious occasions only, like twice a year, they're able to, a public is able to see. Indra Mala is a mala made from one mukhi all the way to 21 mukhi Rudraksha. So this mala is found only in the Pashupatina temple in Nepal. There's so only one mala like that in only, the world. There, there has been more malas like that. Okay, some people have been able to get malas for themselves, which are the Indra Mala, but the temple having the Indra Mala, Pashpatinath is the only one. Okay, and back in the days, Pashpatinath also was unex- unexplored because, again, Nepal is a small country and the infrastructure development has really recently started. Okay, we have, we have been uh, a country which is unexplored in many senses. Back in 1960s, there were only about three to four shops in the premises of Pashpatinath, the first shop in it was the shop of late Srimati Lakshmi, who is my grandmother, who started, you know, with Rudraksha and providing Rudraksha. Today, Nepal Rudraksha supplies to more than 163 countries. But one thing remains, each and every Rudraksha that we supply or sell to the devotees are touching the Lord Pashpatinath temple and then being shipped because it needs to be energized. In, uh, Devi Purana, what is mentioned is if a uh, energized or Shakti Rudraksha is worn, 21 generations receive enlightenment. So 11 generation forward, 11 generation backward are receiving enlightenment just by the touch or sight of an energized Rudraksha. So that is that is how auspicious it is. And Pashpatinath plays an extremely vital role in that. Of course, you've been to the temple multiple times in your yes. life. You've yes. lived and breathed the temple. So my house actually is 
we're able to see Pashpatinath temple from my house. So my village, I am from Pashpatinath. So I didn't move to Pashpatinath. Our establishment didn't happen in Pashpatinath, but my even my great grandfather lived in Pashpatinath. So it's as if I am from Pashpatinath. That is that my father was actually born in a house which is touching the temple. So that's the reason I feel like I'm blessed to be talking to you today about Rudraksha. You know, it's it's it has a lot to do with me being from Pashpatinath as well. Pashpatinath sends people who are who do different things for Shiva. And one of the things that I think my family chosen to do is educate people about the science of Rudraksha. Tell me about your personal relationship with the temple. So every morning from my room, from the day I was, I, I can remember, you know, maybe, maybe I was 10, 7, 8, 8 years old, maybe. From my room before going to sleep and after waking up, I can see Lord Pushpanath Temple and I always bow down. Okay. And the relationship is such that I feel I take, I took Pashpatinath for granted for a long while. Because if you're born in a place where you are you are able to see the temple every day, you don't realize the value. It happened to me, I think, until the age of 18. One fine day, and this is exactly how it happened. One fine day, I was in the rooftop of my house looking at Pashpindar Temple with my friend, okay? And we were talking about different things, right? And I saw the temple and I realized that this is the exact temple which is found in people's house in pictures. And I'm able to witness it live, you know? So that changed something in me that made me feel like, the auspiciousness of the place that I was being, that the place that I was standing in, I, I was not able to comprehend for the longest of my life. So after that, I've been so grateful that I was born in the vicinity of Pashupatinath and I'm able to see Pashupatinath every single day of my life, which is a blessing. So the personal relationship with me to Pashpatnath is, Pashpatnath is my Ishta Devta. Ishta Devta, Ishta is the favorite God of yours, right? My Ishta Devta, in a personal note, is Pashpatinath. I still want to know more, man. I'll tell you why. Because I've had an intense relationship with God since I was a little kid. Sometimes you move away from God, mm -hmm. even if it's for a tiny phase. Mm -hmm. Have you had a phase like that? We've kind of moved away from it. I have. I have. I have had a phase where, you know, I I was not paying attention to the spiritual side in me. I was maybe paying attention to a lot of different things because with age, you know, uh, what happens is you start to be right now. It's so easy to do that. So easy to fall prey to social media, just just be all about the virtual world and not realize where you are. So that's the reason I said, right, up until the age of 18, I was not even appreciating the place that I was born in. I was, I was doing the rituals, like you said, like you said that you, you know, prayed, you did everything. You were not very spiritual, but you were doing that every day. Similar to me, I've never, there's never been by the grace of Shiva a day in my life where I have not prayed. That has never happened to me. But intentional praying is, is something that I did later on. So, you know, you pray Om Namah Shivaya, or do a mantra like Om Tarama Kama Jame Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Urvagu Bandhana Tamritta Or Mukshe Mamrathat Right? You do this but you are not there. You are doing it because mm. it's a habit. It's mm. like you know you are you are you are it's it's for example if you work out you know there's some muscle memories that that you do and you are not even paying attention to how many reps you have done. Mm. Similar to that I'm, I'm giving you a very relatable example. So you know when you are doing the mantras you are you are joining your hands you are praying to the God but you are not there. So I started being there very late in my life, which is early, but at the age of 18, I felt like, you know, I was there and I was appreciative of what the mantras were, what each of the word in the mantra meant. I started to dive deeper and then my quest began. Yes, I was born in a family of Vedic practitioners, but there was never a, you know, forced uh, sense of, okay, you have to do this. This is what I chose. And I feel I didn't choose this, but this chose me instead. What did your grandfather tell you about Pashupatinath? So my grandfather passed away when I was um, 
in the grade four. So I was eight years old when he passed away. But you you would have had some memory. Of- some mem- yes, some memory. So I, I'm coming to that. The some memory that I have is my grandfather was literally carrying me his his playground. He used to play chess, right? He was he was he was a priest at Pashupatinath Temple. Um, he he used to do. He was a priest. He used to do the you know the the uh, karma kanda priest. So he used to do the karma kanda. He used to do your puja for you. So that's the kind of family that I come from. But he carried me. He took me to the temple. That much I remember, you know. So temple journey, going to the going to the premises of temple began very early to me. But my grandfather always said this: that Shiva is everywhere. In his room, I remember, you know, I remember his room, the room that he passed away in eventually, uh, you know, and his room. He had all the pictures of all the deities, and he said, you know, that the temple is where you pray. You can pray anywhere. You don't have to, you know, go to a temple. Even though we were re- sitting right beside Pashupati Nath, he considered that, you know, the most important thing is your gratitude and, you know, your your bhakti towards the Lord. And that's exactly what he did, and that instilled in me. So today, even today, even if I'm traveling, I just close my eyes, I see Shiva, and I, you know, do a Rudravi shake in my head. And this is a this is a very common practice. Sivas Manas Puja is one of the stotra that you listen to, right? Manas Puja, what does that mean? When Adi Shankaracharya um, came to came to Pashpatinath, what happened is he didn't find the resources. Like I said, it was unexplored. He didn't find the resources to do all the puja. So what did he do? He did the Shiva Manas Puja and did the puja with his mind he he was offering the milk the panchamrit yes. the flowers everything in the manas goosebumps to worship right so that's exactly what my grandfather instilled in me is the main puja that you can do is close your eyes meditate on shiva and the puja happens there and there and to get to this level of spirituality or awakening use tools like rudraksha that's simple one has to truly experience this within the mind puja to understand the impact it has on your spiritual journey mm. and to understand the impact it has on your sense of bhakti yes um i offer some thing to the deities i pray to in this room like right behind you mm-hmm. every night and i definitely can't do it every night of the year because i travel a lot because yeah. of work yeah but there is not a single day that i go to sleep without performing the puja in my head at least or yes. ideally performing it here yeah. in the physical realm but if i'm traveling i don't care where it is i could be on an overnight flight to america i'll perform it in the flight yes because that is the power of visualization as well as the power of your own heart and soul yeah and that requires a lot of practice because you know how negative thoughts can come and affect the visualization aspect of yours so this is something that you probably have worked on for a long time that now even if you close your eyes you're able to exactly see the deities that you want to offer you know your your prasadam to your your um you know naivedya to and do the complete the puja all in your head because it's you know for someone who's already doing it it sounds like it's it's a common practice that you can do even in your flight to the us but for someone who has never done this to be in that state of being able to visualize is extremely difficult and how do i know this is because being a rudraksha consultant you know i consult a lot of people i have seen my father consult a lot of people and i have heard stories of my grandfather consult a lot of people and the first thing that they have problem with is being able to stop the noise in their head because once the noise stops once the room is closed that is when the puja begins that is when the sadhana begins the number one factor that affects a person is their ability to concentrate and focus and you know there are tools for us for for that to be aided for there are sadhans for the sadhana to be done but you understand what i mean the negative noises in your head can definitely pollute the sadhanas that you do and for you to be able to visualize and do the sadhana in the air when half of the people are probably scared of falling down in the airplane because a lot of people like me are scared of flights right i fly a lot i you know i'm almost flying monthly or every every few months but to be able to concentrate close everything you know to attain mrityunjaya meaning 
the fear of mrityu is gone and be able to practice even if it's for 30 second that has brought you close to shiva that is not a that is not a you know simple okay i do this kind of a thing for someone who's doing it it might be common but for someone who's not done it that's a great feat it's like running a 90 km marathon which is possible because every day you're running a kilometer correct every single bow down to the god counts every single thought of prayer counts every single step you take towards spirituality whether it just be om namah shivaya just that counts it adds up it's not going you know somewhere it's all adding up and it has led to this day today okay i'm going to get a little open on the show now yeah um everyone who watches the show regularly and i'm sure that the people who stuck till this point of this episode mm-hmm. are the ones who watch it regularly um <laughs> everyone knows that i'm low key an emotional guy yeah okay there's a lot of emotions going on inside which i've blocked out for mm-hmm. the sake of business and my career mm-hmm. in general uh i've had like two very intense situations after my career had begun and both were not related to my career they were breakups i had mm-hmm. along the journey and i was in a very terrible state of pain and those were the phases which also led to one a lot of material growth but more importantly a lot of spiritual growth because i personally feel that pain especially after a breakup is simply love that doesn't know where to go mm-hmm. and the moment you have this realization you realize that okay what if i direct that love to god mm-hmm. even if you have a little openness towards prayer your prayer becomes more ferocious when you're able to pour your pain into the prayer yeah when you're able to pour your emotions into the prayer because i personally feel that both pain and love come out of the same place which is your emotional body in some ways yeah uh but simply this practice one helps you heal that material pain that you're going through and i truly believe even love is material mm-hmm. but emotions are not and not only does it heal your material pain it also helps you go way deeper into your relationship with your deity or your god mm. uh when you're able to submit your pain completely to the deity and you know what i'll go as far as saying that i've struggled with being single in my life because i tend to get lonely and because of just i don't know early, earlier that's how i looked at life that i always wanted a partner but the moment i realized that hold on the single life allows me to give more time to my deity or my god that's when my relationship with the divine increased much more quickly it became much deeper it kind of made me realize and this is something a lot of shiva bhakts would say it kind of made me realize the isolation of the mind when your mind and your heart are truly in the process of praying to shiva mm mm-hmm. I don't know if you would feel the same but uh my relationship with Shiva has increased so deeply over the last few years that one I feel very calm and that allows me to traverse through life mm-hmm. but secondly I really really enjoy being alone like I really enjoy my solitude and now I'm able to pour what I used to think of as loneliness I used to look at it in a negative way now I look at it positively and I pour that loneliness into my god it made me think that love as a human need is actually not romantic but it's spiritual mm-hmm. you have the capacity to love you think you want a girlfriend or a boyfriend but that love exists within you to give to god lots of people won't agree and i'm not discouraging the idea of marriage or romance i'm just trying to encourage the idea that when you're single and you have all that excess love to give go and give it to god yeah it makes life much easier yeah So I have a I have a I have a similar take in some sense that yes you are a ball of energy humans are balls of energies and wherever you invest that energy is what comes to your life so if you're investing it only on one aspect maybe your married married life or maybe your relationship then the only return you can expect expect is going to be from that front you can't expect god to come closer to you when your only 100% of your energy is going to a certain direction but the beauty of the mind is it can you know segregate and absolutely divide and conquer so the 
I think the most important practice for one to do, and I might be wrong, is for them to be able to balance their spiritual and the personal life because there is ashrams that you go through. In the first phase of life, you go through the Brahmachari ashram where your focus should only be on the Brahmacharya, meaning Brahma's attaining the Brahma. Brahma means Gyan. So any form of you know education, any form of understanding of you know religion understanding of spirituality understanding of basic practices should be when you are in the brahmacharya ashram after that you transcend into the grihasthi ashram because in the grihasthi ashram is where you you should be or else you'll fail you should be able to balance the spiritual and the grihasthi meaning your family life right and then ultimately is when you do the van prastha one prastha is when you are, you know, you leave everything behind, when you renunciate everything and go solely to Shiva. So if something is happening where the balances are jumbled up, you're doing something wrong, right? For example, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. It's never moksha, artha, dharma, kama. There is always a reason things fall into a certain way, right? The dharma is the f- number one thing. Virtue, English if you translate it to direct English, it's virtue. Dharma is virtue. But if you go deeper, it's your responsibility. As a child, your responsibility, your dharma is to study, mm. is to educate yourself. As a businessman, your dharma is to make profit and sustain your team. As a mother, your dharma is to you know take care of your children and balance your life as well. A father's dharma is to take care of your children. Father, you know, your do your father responsibilities as well. So if someone is getting disaligned with the dharma, some kind of wrong practice they are practicing. Okay. Similarly, after dharma comes the artha. Because whatever you're doing as your dharma, that needs to be meaningful to you. Artha in basic Nepali or Sanskrit is meaning. Nothing deeper than that. So your responsibility should be meaningful. Give you some kind of meaning. And if this is happening, if you are doing what you're supposed to do at the right time, that is what it says as right time in the right place. That's basic dharma is what the person is doing. And then you can see the arthic growth. Arthic growth is not only sense of material fulfillment, but the emotional fulfillment of being happy with what you're doing. After that, happy is karma. And ultimately, once you are in that state, you are finally able to go to the mukti. Phase. And mukti does not only happen when you're about to die. It happens while you're alive. Mukti is end of a cycle. Everything in life is a cycle. Your loneliness or you being without someone is a cycle. For that, you need to follow the basic principle of the four. Get out of it. The mukti will lead you into a next cycle in life. Maybe that is of a married life. That again is a cycle. It starts with dharma. What are your responsibilities as a married person? Mm. Then it will start giving you meaning. Then you'll be satisfied and you'll ultimately seek for the next step which you attain mukti from. Then you follow the you know next step. So life is chakra. Life is a wheel, right? It all comes back. It all comes back and then it you know, keeps moving until the day you die. And even after that, according to Sanatana Dharma, if it balances out, right? If your karmas are not to the to to the fullest extent of, you know, being able to renunciate everything and attain mukti, you come back to this world again. Based on your prenatal karma, which is the karma of the past life, the soul chooses the body and the family where it's born. So our karma today, the cycles that we go through today is not only for this life, but the life after this, right? Because where you're born is decide, is being decided as you do your karmas today. And if you're born is also being decided. <laughs> so, you know, so this cycle transcends life and this cycle goes on. And one of the beauties of Rudraksha, I'm sorry, I'm adding Rudraksha here, fine. but the beauty of Rudraksha and the reason Rudraksha is used in across all spiritual practices is it's the only thing that can rectify your karmic debt. You attain karmic debt in everything and anything you do. In Kali Yuga even more. The piece of bread that you eat in the morning, you don't know how it's coming out. You don't know the people who have been disappointed or disfavored or been, you know, uh, treated unfairly while that single piece of bread is produced. I'm giving an example of a bread because I'm assuming most of the people have bread in the morning. 
but you can go deeper into everything and you accumulate a lot of karmic debt for people who understand this concept of karmic debt the single purpose of life starts to begin is to balance it out is to do good karmas to do good more than bad you're always trying to balance it and rudraksha is a tool that helps you balance it it's said that even through a sight of rudraksha which is seeing you know you can't comprehend how is that possible the karma is being done in the material how is my sight or looking at rudraksha going to purify everything but there is only a chosen pe- chosen few out of 8 billion people how many people do you think are going to tune into this show and mm. be able to see the rudraksha for people who are already seeing it it's very common how can it be but for people who have never seen a rudraksha there are a lot of those as well so to purify your karmic debt take you out of this cycle and take you to the place where you truly belong and truly be able to express yourself rudrakshas and tool like that you like you said mantras upasana tantra upasana and yantra upasanas are extraordinarily vital do you think as you wear it and you chant mantras the energy of the rudraksha also changes i don't think i know it changes because it's a uh, mention it's a written it's written in our scriptures that chanting with rudraksha has almost koti meaning crores worth more benefit and more power than chanting without one because like i said while you chant mantra each mantra has a certain vibration and energy that you are you know putting out in the universe and once the cycle you said you are doing certain amount of upasana the reason is you want the you want to uh, let's imagine you're building a stair to the deity that you are trying to reach with every mantra you're reaching closer to the deity right you're sending the sound sending the frequency you're trying to awaken the deity and just you just want the deity to glance at you once that's enough for you to understand to realize to for the deity to recognize that ranveer exists is the only thing that you are trying to achieve with the mantra sadhana right rudraksha is the stairway to that stair just it's the common practice you're taking an elevator mm. so that is mentioned and this is not my philosophy that i'm trying to put out here this is what our dharma our sanatana dharma says uh, i'm really happy i met you bro because i don't meet too many people in the 20s who are as informed and as emotionally driven as you are about spiritual conversation about scriptural knowledge etc and i feel that when audience members see another young person who's also materially successful talk about spiritual things it does shift something i know that we've got a big teenage audience you know and if i had gotten access to these kind of conversations when i was a teenager i think shifts in my life would have happened earlier does nepal have a lot of presence of bhairav yes okay before i let you expand more on that yes I want to ask you to explain what bhairav means to your heart and based on what your family has told you because I've had five different people on the show say five different things and none of them were wrong mm. but my logic is that I average out what I understand from the spiritual conversation on the show so I'd love for you to expand so on it so bhairav is a form of shiva he is the form of Sh- shiva uh, and he is also a shivgan Okay now I'm telling two different contradictory statements here he is shiva how is he a shiva gan so before doing uh, I do rudrabhishek every monday not trying to boast or say anything but that is something that practice I have been doing for a long time right before actually worshiping the shivalinga you worship the shiva gans in all the direction so the there are two bhairavs that you worship during worship of the shivalinga the first one is the kirti mukha bhairav kirti mukha bhairav the second one you worship is the unmukta bhairav okay there are different forms of bhairav there is kal bhairav unmukta bhairav there is you know safe setu setu bhairav we call it the white bhairav right so the unmukta bhairav and kirti mukha bhairav both have deities and this you know presence inside the pashupati nath premises itself kirti mukh bhairav only has head okay he was the manifestation of bhairava with only head because he is so aghora so high in energy that he ate the entire body of his so only the head part remains that is kirti mukh bhairav 
found in Ashwatthinath temple. Second one is the charged form of Shiva, the Unmukta Bhairav. Okay, where you see the Unmukta Bhairav deity inside Ashwatthinath temple, you are going to, you are not going to be able to look eye to eye to the to the to the deity because it's fully energetic. Okay, fully charged. You'll see and. I'm not trying to make this conversation vulgar, but you'll see an erect phallus of the Unmukta Bhairav inside Pashpatina temple. So the deity is almost 10 feet tall, okay, about uh, 10 feet wide. And it's structured in such a way that the, every, the only thing you feel is the charged form of Bhairav, which is only calm there because Pashpatina is calming him through the Aghor Mukh of the Pashpatinath. Okay, the Aghor Mukh, the Aghor face of the Shivalinga faces the Unmukta Bhairav who's been calmed down by the presence of Shiva. So Bhairav plays an important role. There's lots of Bhairav, you know, um, uh, deities, Bhairav statues, Bhairav murtis, Bhairav temples all around Shiva and all around Nepal. Uh, and the single most important aspect of Bhairav is he's a form of Shiva. And he is the uh, form of Shiva that destroys de demons. So he is the, he is not the silent one. He is not the one that is in rest. He is the active one. Kali and Bhairav play a very similar role. They are the ones who go after demons and are extremely active deities. On a very everyday level, why does Bhairav choose certain people to be Upasaks? Because not everyone prays to Bhairav. So not everyone's even drawn to it. No, no. So there is, in my opinion, and I have seen, I, I consult a lot of people, like I said, you know, and the people who are generally attracted to Bhairavs are people who have a certain inclination towards destruction, not in a bad way, but in a good way, annihilation, destruction of something for a new beginning to start. That is what Bhairav gives you. The energy of Bhairav is the energy which allows you to end certain things in life for new chapters to begin. So if you're trying to kill your demons, if you're trying to kill your negative thoughts, if you're trying to kill something or any, you know, kill certain energies that are surrounding you, the person will be drawn towards Bhairav. Bhairav is also a deity that you will be drawn into if you are affected a lot by evil eye. You know, if you are affected a lot by what people will say about you, you are more than likely to be turned towards Bhairav because that's your natural instinct saying that I need protection and Bhairav is the one who's going to protect me. So a person who seeks protection, a person who seeks a, a kind of like a, a figure that protects him from all the negative around is going to be drawn into Bhairav. Perhaps even the negative within and like I said, the negative that within is also destroyed by Bhairav. Um, so many things to say, man. Like, again, Bhairav visited me. I didn't go looking for it. I was in Banaras. And of all the temples I possibly could have visited in Banaras, I only went to the Kal Bhairav temple. Because the name Kal Bhairav just attracted me. And you and I may be connected because this is from Kal Bhairav that I visited about four weeks ago to Banaras, Kashi and work Kal Bhairav. You need to take permission of Kal Bhairav in order for you to do the darshan of Kashi Vishwanath. You knew about this, right? Yes. So that's the reason you went there. And you will find in the premises a lot of people are, you know, uh, giving you mantra and blessings in the premises inside Bhairavnath. And that is all to word of negative eyes, word of negative energies. The 11 Mukhi Rudraksha is also associated with Bhairav and 11 Rudras. And it's also a Rudraksha that is used for protection. So Bhairav in its sense is a deity that protects and the deity that destroys evil. Mm. That's, that's the basic draw towards Bhairav. I would argue that it's also one of the most misunderstood deities. Very much so, because what, what we think in today's day is death is negative. Killing is negative. You see about Shiva, even he has that image for some. He's like, Shiva is a destroyer, is what you see and, you know, hear people saying. What is he destroying though? He's destroying the cycle for a new cycle to start. Okay. So Shiva, you know, Shravan is the most sacred time for Shiva, right? Why is it? 
Shravan is when rain happens. Rain, heavy rain that destroys and takes out soil from every place. It looks in the in the present state that Shravan is destroying everything. Flood is happening everywhere. Crops are dead. You know, every single, you know, soil is, you know, mixed and there is there is chaos all around. But what does that begin? In a year, in a month or two, after Shravan, what happens? New plant blooms. New beginning starts, right? So the reason they are misunderstood is because you're looking from a distance. Okay, see, Shravan is the worst time because rain all the, all the place, you know, it destroys crops. But if you look at it at a deeper level, that destruction is what led new, new fasal to begin. Mm. Right. So Bhairav is also misunderstood because you will only see one aspect of him. Oh, Bhairav is a very de demon-like deity which kills everything. Very high energy. You should not do, do upasana. But what is he killing? What is he destroying? What is Bhairav's energy and the taqat that he is showing? What is it all about? It's about destruction, but of evil. Ah, uh, so much to say here. Because... First of all, I'm doing an English spiritual podcast after a very long time and I've had some time to just live life. Yeah. And you need some time to accumulate experiences, accumulate certain spiritual learnings and then bring it back for the world to see. Uh, so just for a second, Nachiket, just could you move? I want to show you my Murti. So that's my, can you see it? Yes. That's the Kalvera with the dog behind it. Yep. Uh, that's the main kind of idol for me, which all my upasana centered on. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Udaipur in July of last year. Mm -hmm. And before the trip, I don't know whether it was a dream or it was just a very strong gut feeling that my Udaipur trip was going to be related to Bhairav in some way. I think it was because I just begun that job. Okay. So something had told me that something about Bhairav is going to happen. Okay. Um, very nice trip. Udaipur is known for its fancy resorts. I know. I went there for a fancy vacation, uh, but open to the possibility of having a spiritual experience. There's a hotel called the Uday Villas Hotel. Uh, right before you enter the hotel, on the left, there is a shop that sells statues and uh, antique works, etc., etc. That's the shop I was drawn to. Okay. It's like there's something in that shop. Uh, there's a really tall Shiva like on this. Uh, altar. So that's the tall Shiva I saw in the shop. And I was like, okay, that I'm definitely taking. Uh, but there's something else in this shop without thinking about Bhairav. It's just a thought of meeting Bhairav was in my heart uh, at the start of the trip and throughout the trip. And I knew that it's going to find me. But I al always thought it would probably be a temple that I would visit. Little did I know that once I took the Shiva statue, I went inside the shop and I was just looking at the different idols and there was Tons of Krishna idols, tons of Hanumanji idols, tons of Shivji idols, etc, etc. Uh, I just saw one Bhairav idol, which was this. Yeah. And I was like, that's the one I'm taking. Now, the owner looked at me and he's like, why do you want to take that? I said, I have my reasons. Because the moment I saw it, I knew that, okay, this is one of the reasons mm -hmm. I am taking it. Mm -hmm. uh, the owner said that this particular statue has been in his family for three generations and it's just been lying in the shop. Wow. And they had got it from someone who had used the statue for their own upasana. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I'm very shocked that you're choosing this one. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. And that idol in my house has not only created changes, but also material growth and also very deep levels of spiritual incline. And I definitely have prayed to it to destroy my internal demons, mm -hmm. which at this point is possibly a sense of ego, possibly a sense of anger towards the world and towards mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. possibly a sense of wanting to not go into my sadhana as deeply as I should. Yeah. Uh, so when I felt like my sadhana wasn't going as deep as I intended for it to go, I didn't know what to do. And I literally looked at that idol one night. And that's what they say about Kal Bhairav, that if you really want to connect with the idol, you talk honestly to it. Because often when people are even talking to God, they are sort of lying to God because they're sort of lying to themselves as well. Mm -hmm. So every time I'm trying to talk to Kal Bhairav, I try to go to the depths of my own honesty. That's what my mentor in all these things, Shri Rajashi Nandi has told me that if you're having a conversation with Kal Bhairav, you talk very openly. 
really ask yourself if every sentence that you're saying is truly honest and that's the only rule i follow yeah so i looked at the idol and i said that you know i know i'm not perfect right now but why don't you just destroy what's on the inside in order for my sadhana to further and that's exactly what happened of course i can't reveal all the details absolutely because some things are private but people get removed from your life friends get removed from your life situations get removed from your life uh and you're left with what is needed for the next cycle to begin mm-hmm. to reiterate your thought and things have just gone upward in my life things are already going upward but i think the pace of the upward trajectory has increased and this is my own personal relationship with kal bhairav of course i'm still a shiv bhakt in my core uh when you just spoke about shiv ji throughout this episode every time you mention shiv ji or pashupati nath there's a part of my heart that feels a very strong sense of stillness when you speak about bhairav there's a part of my heart that feels a sense of motivation yeah but the motivation is to get towards the stillness again yeah uh that is my very ethereal possibly not completely accurate understanding of bhairav ji because i'm still getting there myself but this is what i wanted to relay on the show yeah. so uh i'd like to ask you again about your personal relationship with bhairav have you had a phase where you've particularly prayed to this deity and i ask you that because i follow rajesh nandi on twitter uh he speaks a lot about how bhairav upasana all over the world especially in our subcontinent but all over the world bhairav is awakening again in the material realm yeah that effectively means that the deities are always awake in their own realm but they make the presence felt more in our realm when the time is right right now there's been an explosion of awareness as well as popularity when it comes to bhairav in general but not everyone including myself has completely understood what bhairav truly stands for which is why all my questions are directed towards you yeah the first thing i don't think that was a business ploy because a lot of people would be nervous to keep a worshiped deity in their house which is out of, out of your gotra right so you are you are doing something that is out of your norm so this deity that you showed about bhairav was meant to be for you right or else it would not come here right so your trip to udaipur even though relaxation was the main you know point it probably was there and i would say not probably definitely was there because the deity wanted to make a entrance to your life right this is a time in your life where you're probably getting gurus right so for example guru like raj shrinandhi ji um and bhairav who is your ishta devta now uh, who you're you know you're getting a lot of guidance in this uh, stage and uh and what i assume is the reason bhairav has come into your life is to do exactly what you articulated as to remove the demons make you focused give you the growth that you need and the upasana of bhairav in nepal is done to counter the effects of shani and the counter the effects of the like you said the ego because when you're talking to bhairav the reason you are talking to bhairav and the reason you are saying every truth is not because you want to tell him he knows everything what are you you who are you to tell him what you know the reason is how humble are you how true and honest to yourself are you because he knows everything when you when when bhairav is sitting in front of you you are not telling him you are telling yourself you are you know bowing down your knee and surrendering yourself to bhairav and then is he going to take control of your life and kill the demons within you and outside of you the people who are going out of your life probably had some negative consequences if they were associated for a longer time and the demons that are inside of you is also being cleansed by bhairav that's exactly the reason we worship bhairav even in nepal for example if someone is suspected of having evil eye right uh, then they would offer uh, some kind of naived to the kirti mukh bhairav deity on the saturdays i would say my mom has almost always made me and my you know entire family go to kirti mukh bhairav temple inside pashupati nath to offer dahi and beaten rice chura to the kirti mukh bhairav deity it's one of the one of the food that we consider is of liking to bhairav and we do this on a saturday so that all the evil spirits are calmed and bhairav takes care of us so maybe 
what I suspect is the reason Bhairav came into your life is because there were negative energies that were about to surround you. And through Bhairav, you're meeting a lot of people, me included, who are coming in, adding some kind of value to your life. Because what you're, what we're doing here is insignificant. It's material. But if we look deeper and go into Ranveer, why is he talking to me today at this time? Is probably because Bhairav wants some kind of message delivered towards you. And the message might be that you need protection and I've come into your life to protect you. Answer the next question in a yes or no. Are there experiences that you had that you'll never share on a public platform? No, I will share. I have really? had these experiences, but the reason I will share is because if anyone else has had these experiences, the best thing, I think the most important thing that gets us out of ourselves and out of the lack of information is sharing. Who am I to gatekeep the experiences that I've had? If I gatekeep someone else millions of miles away, having the same information is unjust. He's just looking for that answer, which I was looking when I was really young, right? So I've had experiences where, you know, you attain a certain spiritual height or attain a certain spiritual awakening for a little while where times you can see the end of time. You can see time ending. And that is the most scary, you know, thing for someone to feel. Because time is very relative. Right now we have an hour, 60 minutes. Every minute has 60 seconds. But there is a spectrum where you can stand, a level of conscious where you can reach where time is, you know, it, it goes on a different level. You can see the beginning of time and end of time. And then you are unguided because there is, you need to find a guru and guru in today's day is associated with a physical person who is old probably, and you know, looks a certain way, but guru can be your inner instinct. People find guru in their deities. I think you found your guru in Kal Bhairav or Bhairav. I found my guru in Rudraksha. When I was in that state, the only thing that could answer my questions was when I hold the Rudraksha and, you know, deeply meditate and come back to the real world. Is the Rudraksha a manifestation of Shivji himself? Yes. It is. It is. So what happened is there was a Asura known as Tripura Asura. Tripura Asura Asura was a Asura that had beaten Brahma and Vishnu both. Okay. The only deity remaining out of the Trinities that could beat uh, Tripura Asur from destruction of everything was Shiva. But even for Shiva, it was not an easy feat okay, to achieve. So what Shiva did was he opened his eyes, kept his eyes open and manifested a weapon which is known as the Aghora weapon in order to kill or destroy the Tripura Asur Asur. It took him thousand years is what Devi Purana mentions. Thousand years of only still manifestation. Even for Shiva, he needs to work something. Karma needs to be there. Okay. It, it took him a thousand years of opened eye manifestation to manifest the Aghor weapon, which after manifested Shiva's eye, you know, there was a water drop from Shiva's eye out of happiness that the Agora weapon has finally been manifested, which is now going to kill the Tripurasur. And through that tear, Rudraksha was born. And like I said, it is a manifestation of a seed, which is, which is the only seed that is manifested for the mankind. There has not been a creation for the mankind. There has been creation like and around mankind. The only creation mentioned in the scriptures that is created for the benefit of mankind, which is so hard for us to believe today, it is created for me. Who am I to be created for? But it is created for the mankind because Bholenath has done a lot of things out of self-sacrifice. He's the one, Nilkant, you know, poison in his throat, let others live. He's Bholenath. Shiva, how can I describe him, right? You'll, you and I will start crying if we go deeper into Shiva. But he, his tears of, uh, you know, Aghor Tapasya for the Aghor weapon is what created Rudraksha. And 
for us who live in the material it is very difficult for us to imagine that a seed which is available today right next door can change one's life but the information to get out of here to get in here is everything is accessible right here you don't have to die in order for your soul to mature you don't have to go out of this world to bring something in the world which can transform you the tools the resources the knowledge right around you steve jobs now i'm bringing steve jobs who is random at this conversation i read his book one of the things that stood out was he said if a person is and someone said to him so i remember this is if a some is someone is uh, ready to travel around the world to find a guru the guru appears next door <laughs> okay so similar to that the conversation that we are having if someone reaches the state where we are in they're able to realize that yes there is a tool very hard for us to believe but there is a tool out there in this physical world which can transform us today i want to talk about that moment you spoke about time dilation mm -hmm. or expansion mm -hmm. rudimentary guesswork on my end have you seen the end of interstellar so my memories about movies my family just hates it that i forget everything okay fair fair but but i know the vague concept of interstellar where they travel in time and you know they wake up and they're in different time and stuff yes i have watched it but uh, i don't remember it it's something like what you discussed where it goes to a dimension beyond time yeah so two dimensional thinking is x axis y axis three dimensional is height they say that time is the fourth dimension mm -hmm. and it can be traveled across mm -hmm. uh but it's a reality which is beyond human understanding and it's come up a little bit when we speak to some astrophysicists on the show it's come up a lot when we speak to spiritualists on the show uh everyone kind of touches upon this conversation but it honestly is a conversation that is not able to be expressed through human words and human conversation yeah the reason for that probably is because we're still making it a material travel we're so associated with i that when we assume of time travel you are going to assume yourself wearing the same shirt same pant and traveling through time if you just close your eyes and are able to manifest and are able to concentrate enough spiritually awaken enough you and i can go back to 1980s today not in this body but our mind can why are we not associating that with the self and this with the self and ass assuming that you and i will fly like an airplane to 1980s and that is time travel what if we're already time traveling backwards you can see not just through your memories but if you do the upasanas you are able to land in a state wherever you want to that can be in the past or in the future one thing won't exist you Hmm. Yeah. Um I don't feel like asking you further about this exact experience for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. I I don't think you will be able to even capture the right words to relay it. It it is an experience that a person should feel, but the energy in the room has already changed when I spoke about this, right? So the energy about the experience that I felt can only be felt because it's an energy, it's a it's a state of mind. it's not a physical place that i went to where i can describe how the air was how the feel was or how the temperature was we are so associated in the physical form of ours that to share an experience to you i'll have to give you physical examples sure okay. i but this experience was so spiritual that i can only share it with you if you are able to be that spiritual and go to that level of spirituality I'll have a go at explaining time dilation a little bit. Sure. In just a few sentences, I'm not going to relay any of my own experiences. Uh but what I will say is there have been very deep meditations where I feel like I've been meditating for 5 minutes, but it's actually been an hour and a half. That's a very easy way of explaining what time dilation feels yeah. like. There have been meditations where I definitely know that I'm not in my own body i feel like an hour to have passed but it's actually just been 5 minutes yeah 
and i have not understood either of these all i know is that i'm able to reach those points when i'm truly focused upon the technique that i've been taught in my meditation because there are techniques to alter the state of your mind to give your mind very very deep rest and then come back into the material world with a lot more energy and a lot more creativity and a lot more healing mm. uh which is why i talk so much about meditation on the show because i've seen aspects of the mystical side of it but mostly the material aspects what daily meditation can bring you and your sense of reality which brings me back to the question i asked you much earlier what's your upasana yeah so meditation is definitely a part of it meditation has taken um me to places like i said where words are in is, you know not sufficient for me to describe and the one thing that has aided really well in meditation is tools that i used for meditation name mainly i meditate with my eyes closed there are open eye meditation so it depends on whether you are too associated with the physical or too associated with the environment if you are too much into your physical and you are you are even able to hear your heart beats and as soon as you close your eyes you start to get frightened and sweaty just open your eyes and meditate meditate is yoga yoga is all about chitta vritti nirodha that's the first sentence of patanjali who wrote the yoga sutra right patanjali we know it as a brand today but patanjali is a rishi who wrote the yoga sutra out of which yoga and meditation stems out of right the first sentence that he wrote which we forget is yoga's chitta vritta nirodha chitta means the mind lake if it starts to you know wander that is not yoga so if you are able to keep your you know mind lake chitta still then you are in a meditative state right how do you keep that first you need to practice second you need tools you definitely need tools and the tool that has been recommended not by me or my family but by the shiva purana and all these scriptures is the rudraksha which is the tool that helps you not only get to that state but remain in that state right because the energies that you will get that you will come across in the uncharted territory you might or might not be ready for therefore you use certain tools secondly the upasana that i do is also a mantra upasana mantra is extremely strong the only person who is able to describe the strength of mantra is a person who has chanted mantra themselves there are certain mantra you chant out loud there are certain mantras you chant within there are certain pranayamas that you do by chanting inhaling and exhaling you are while you mantra let me go deeper what is mantra what does the mantra sentence mean there is a lot of meaning that you can find just by knowing what the word means mantra is the sound of man what is your inner voice english inner voice so when i'm saying mantra i'm just saying inner voice there are people who come to me say i do 10 gayatri mantras in the morning all day i have negative thoughts all day so they are doing negative thought mantras throughout the day mm -hmm. and trying to purify those by 10 gayatri mantras that is not mantra mantra is when even while i'm talking to you om namah shivaya plays in my in the within that is mantra and that is the mantra sadhana i do i don't i don't sit down and i don't have to do like 10 hours of you know mantra sadhana if i am able to breathe in and breathe out my mantras if it's in your breath it's in your breath and i'm not saying i'm an enlightened soul in any way but that is what has worked for me because i live in a material world I live in a material world. I have obligations and I realize that the things that I need to do, I should be able to do it in my deathbed too. It should be sustainable. So I only choose practices that I know I can do it until the day I die. Let let's just put that as a measurement, right? Okay. Can I do mantra 10,000 mantra a day until the day I die? I highly doubt it. sorry me i i did out there are probably people who can do it mantra that is the thing second tantra tantra is all about controlling your senses right not you know speaking when whatever is in your mind that is also a tantra practice process management of the process of your emotion coming to your mouth controlling it at not saying that's the basic tantra practice i do yantra i wear rudraksh i look at the astrological chart i look at what what are the planets in play 
I don't assume my ego to be too big that oh I don't need anything. I assume myself to surrender and take what resources are available to me. And use Rudraksha as my yantrik support. So my upasana is really a practical one. What I do in the morning is I worship the deities, the panchayans. Panchayans are the five deities that a person is recommended to worship. The panchayans are Shiva, Vishnu, Devi, Surya, Ganesh. These are the five deities everyone should worship, right? The panchayans. After the panchayan worship, I go about the day. I go about the day and in my mind, I'm doing the mantras. While I drive, if I listen to the Anuman Chalisa, that's the mantra sadhana for me because it is practical for me in the day I am born. Maybe there's a reason I'm born today, but that is what is practical for me. I can't go to Hanuman temple every single day to do this sadhana. Me personally, the life I live. That does not give me an excuse to avoid Hanuman Chalisa altogether. That requires me to be creative about my sadhanas. So what I have seen as a pattern is oh my God, sadhana is so tough. I'll do it later when I'm 40. Mm. By the time you're 40, you've already forgotten that God exists. You're only fearfully awakened. You're not spiritually awakened. Right now is when, when you're young is when you can achieve the Brahma that you are searching for. But be creative about it. If you can't do 10 Hanuman chalices in a day, you know, I've seen people recommend 100 Chanman chalices in a day. And the person sitting next door is so frightened that, oh my God, I can't do this. Jai Sri Ram, I'm out of here. No, if one is practical for you, do it. If not, just say, Om Jai Hanuman. Okay, let's start. Where can we start? I think that should be the Upasana that all the people do. At least that is the Upasana I do. I do practical Upasana. What I've truly come to believe based on my subjective reality, and you can totally uh, disagree with this if you think differently. But what I truly believe now is that the greatest temple one will ever visit is the temple that one builds within their own heart. Correct. Like, it's the same thing as saying the only Zen you find on top of mountains is the Zen you take there. Mm -hmm. Everyone escapes to the Himalayas to mm -hmm. find God. God can be built inside you. Yeah. It's present inside you. It can be nurtured and grown. Yeah. Um... I have one last question for you today, which is about the Shiv Puran because you've spoken about it so much throughout this episode. Uh, are you familiar with Ankit Bhaiyan Puriya? No. Ram Ram Bhai Saryane. He's a big social media revolution in uh, India. The fastest uh, account that's ever, as in the fastest grown account ever on Indian Instagram. Congratulations to him. Yeah. Uh, he's become a national icon. He's created a fitness movement, like a fitness revolution in the whole country, right from tier one up to tier three, tier four. Like he's become that famous and impactful. Uh, he used to read the Shiv Puran in the middle of his day and he used to kind of vlog each day. Wow. Um, we had him on the show and he attributes all his success to scriptural knowledge and scriptural wisdom that's changed his life and his reality. Uh, I have often heard people talk about the Bhagavad Gita on the show. Uh, I will definitely have a phase of my life where I deep dive into the Bhagavad Gita. I think I need classes, honestly. That's been my consensus. I need someone to actually take me through it. Uh, but very rarely do people talk about the Shiv Puran. You're only the second guy I've actually heard talk about the Shiv Puran on the show after Ankit Bayan Puriya. Tell me about it because you've read it. Yeah. You've studied it. Uh, I know you can't explain everything, but my basic question to you is what does it change inside your existence? Yeah. So let me let me start with this. Scriptural knowledge is good, but it's not enough because there is three forms of knowledge. Shruti, Smriti, and the scriptures. Shruti and Smriti are listening and remembering. And the scriptures is in the heart. Okay. Out of the 18 Puranas, in Hinduism, we have 18 Puranas. Out of the 18 Puranas, there are in total 400,000 verses in all 18 Puranas. All 18 Puranas combined, there is 400,000 verses, which is 4 lakh verses. The Shiva Purana is one of them. It's based on Shiv, okay? Hence the name. Purana is completion. The name Purana means completion. The thing that completes the Veda is Purana. Again, I'm going into word, but that's where the meaning is. 
so shiva purana completes the form and the information about shiva it does not complete per se it adds to and takes us closer to completion it's still happening it's a happening process shiva purana in the uh, in the uh, satya yuga is said to have 100000 verses today we have 24000 verses in the shiva purana it's said to have 12 samhitas today we have seven samhitas in our shiva purana so a lot of information has already eradicated this is a very good opportunity for people to quit reading about shiva purana but there's still 24% left which is 100% of where you started if you're at zero <laughs> so uh, shiva purana really has seven adhyayas seven uh, sections it dives in a surface level as a story about glorification of shiva and stories about shiva that he goes through but in a deeper level each and every story is a message sent to us that transcends time if you read any scripture in hinduism what you understand is it's a symbolic representation the water is flowing not it's it's not just about a river now what people in today's day are going to do is dig up and find start finding the river no it's a symbolic representation so in shiva purana you'll find lots of stories that shiva went through nirakar rupas rudrakshas you know the mukhis of the rudrakshas the the story about the you know tripurasura the story of how narad muni was once you know so dwelt in ego that he started to think himself as god and was given the head of monkey right so these kind of story all of them are present in the shiva purana so when a person will start reading the shiva purana i guarantee you 99 of the 100 will think oh this is a very basic child like book i'm saying a very controversial thing here but the stories are such but if you are able to see and read behind and underneath and within the meaning the meaning is beyond you and i so shiva purana is the gateway to the all the answers that people are searching but one must first be able to open themselves to knowledge second be more deeper than just surface level understanding and three follow what it's teaching don't assume that you can pick and choose right so shiva purana will tell you to live a certain way and do certain things we are thinking of it as buffet we are thinking of it like i don't want this meal i'll just get this but shiva purana is a way of life it's a emotion it's it's way of living and it's not asking you for much recommending certain actions uh teaching you certain things anecdotally through stories the only thing you need to do is be receptive and go deeper than just a surface level understanding about you know to uh to 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 characters playing a story i'll i'll end with a story uh so and and i'll tell you why it's important so in uh, shiva purana as well as in the uh, devi bhagavat i am always talking about shiva purana and devi bhagavat because shiva and shakti flow together the uh, the purana that mention shakti is the devi bhagavat puran the puran that mention shiva is the shiva puran these are the one of two of the puranas in the 18 right and there is a story about this uh, girish uh, grishnath grishnath that comes i think don't quote me but in the 11th a book of devi bhagavat in chapter 3 or chapter 5 this story comes because some of the viewers would want to read and i recommend reading it of girinath girinath is a very spiritual being he has a son guna uh, guna nidhi guna nidhi uh, now guna nidhi starts to have an affair i'm cutting the story too short starts to have an affair with the wife of his guru own guru he is so attractive and the wife is also attracted towards him then what they eventually end up doing is poisoning the uh, guru and killing the guru okay gunanidhi does that now then time passes away everything happens and gunanidhi dies in a floor right the yamaganas are coming racing and they're trying to put him in hell but the shivaganas are coming too okay and telling them that no he's going to shivalok right and they dug deeper why why is he going to shiva lok he has killed his guru he has killed these people right he has poisoned his own guru had an affair with the other why 25 feet beneath the surface he died 
he finds rudraksha okay and that's the reason he was sent to shivaloka the power that you seek is right in front of you it only depends on whether you want to achieve and take you know take a benefit of it or not so that is the power of shiva that is the power of rudraksha mr sukriti when i was standing outside looking at that sunset with you little did i know there's this atom bomb of a podcast yeah. in you uh, i knew it would be a good conversation i didn't anticipate you to be the way you are um not because of your age or the you know the western way you look you know what i'm saying yeah. uh i'm not someone who judges my guests before but i've often seen that sometimes these atomic level podcast atom bomb level podcast happen slightly unexpectedly yeah. like uh, i remember the first time i met rajashi nandin he was just chilling outside i knew it would be good but i didn't know it would be rajashi nandin i want to say the same thing about you we were just standing there enjoying the sunset all i knew about you is this guy's clearly a shiva bhakt it it shows up in someone's voice in someone's demeanor but little did i know the rest of it <laughs> so i think we found a trs all star ladies and gentlemen bro thank you now i can call you bro and come back yeah. down to 2024 uh, i wish you all the luck man Same you don't need you. it from me no i need it i need all the luck not just from you from the viewers because i feel like uh, energy the energy that you carry the blessings that you carry in your word are of great use to me i'm no one I have no energy of my own so I would love to have the blessings of every single one of you that's the only thing I want to earn in this lifetime like we've done a shiva team podcast after so long i i literally feel like the same feeling you felt in fourth standard when you put a new refill inside your pen and your pen wrote really well i kind of feel like that on the inside so thank you bro thank you uh, lots of love appreciate your time appreciate your presence thank you thank for you. having me thank you that was the episode for today I genuinely believe that there is an overall rise in spiritual thought and spiritual intention all over the subcontinent. That's actually what led me to finding Sukriti in the first place. I was blown away by the fact that this young guy is running a company like this, is running a company that intends to scale within the spiritual domain. Is running a company based on the fact that so many like you and me spiritual seekers who are going about their daily life or trying to grow materially are constantly looking for further guidance further help further knowledge that's why he was on the show in the first place and towards the end of the episode i know for a fact that i was in a bit of a trance all my questions all my opinions that i put out within this conversation came out of a state of flow which doesn't happen in every podcast I'm sure you picked it up if you've listened to the podcast till this point. Of course, Sukriti is going to be back on the show. Please tell me what you thought of this particular episode. I enjoyed the heck out of speaking to him. I deeply enjoyed deep diving into one of my favorite spiritual subjects, which is Shiva. I'm sure you enjoyed it as much. TRS will be back very very soon. Thank you for listening in.